very briefly, let me review where we started. I began by asking three questions. Number one, who wrote this epistle? Who penned it? And I think we are pretty much agreed that the Apostle John, who was the author of the Gospel according to John in the book of the Revelation, penned these three brief but blessed epistles, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. The Apostle John penned this epistle. Question number two, to whom was it written? It's called a general epistle because it was not written to anyone in particular, just a general letter. Most of Paul's letters were written to local churches. Romans was written to the church at Rome. Galatians was written to the churches in the province of Galatia. Ephesians was written to the church at Ephesus, and so on. First and Second Timothy, Titus and Philemon were written to individuals. Two were written to Timothy, one to Titus, one to Philemon. So they were addressed to someone in particular. First John is not addressed to anyone in particular. It's written to the family of God in general. Thus it is called a general epistle. So we learned that this is a family letter coming from the Heavenly Father to His little children or His dear children. Now there are two things I want to state concerning that. Number one, how is this relationship described in 1 John? Well, we studied the word Father and the phrase little children. If you have been born again, you're God's born one, He's your Heavenly Father. That's how the relationship is described. Then secondly, how is the relationship determined? How do I know if I'm in the family? And so we trace the little word born through 1 John. Now we didn't touch on one of the birthmarks of the born again ones. And if you will turn to chapter 5, I want to touch on it. Chapter 5 and verse 18. I close the lesson by telling you a human interest story of a young woman, possibly in her 40s, who had not spoken to her mother for 18 years. And one of the evidences of her salvation was the fact that she hastened to rectify the wrong. That brings me now to verse 18 of 1 John 5. How do I know I'm in the family? How do I know that God is my father and I am one of his dear children? We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not. Now somebody says, you mean if I commit a sin, I'm not saved? No. Verb tenses are very important in the study of your Bible. And unfortunately, here is where one of the modern translations has missed out. The verb tense here is in the present continuous tense. And the King James Version is accurate. We know that whosoever is born of God sineth, not sineth, present continuous tense, keeps on sinning. The verb tense is very important. It is not saying that whosoever is born of God will never sin. If that is true, then none of us are saved because we all have sinned since we were saved. So the verb tense here is something to examine. Whosoever is born of God will not keep on continuing to sin. As the lady was under conviction, and God brought the word to her heart, and she got to the telephone and confessed her wrong and was reconciled to her mother. She did not continue to live in that sin. Now maybe there has been a secret sin in your life or mine, and through the ministry of the word of God it's been brought to your attention. Friend, if you have no desire to confess it and forsake it, there is a question as to whether you have ever been born again. No child of God wants to be out of fellowship with his Heavenly Father. It's a terrible thing to have sin come between God and us. We'll see a little more of that later. How is this relationship determined? Well, you have all these born-again texts to tell us if I'm born again, this is what my behavior will be like. Now, we want to come to the next major emphasis in the first epistle of John. We now come to the third point I suggested yesterday. Number one, 
Who wrote the epistle? Number two, to whom was it written? Question number three, why was it written? What are the reasons for the writing of this epistle? What are the divinely stated purposes for the writing? You'll find them all within the little book itself. Let's look now at the divinely stated reasons for the writing of this epistle. I want to give you the outline in advance. Number one, this book was written to proffer, P-R-O-F-F-E-R, -F -F -E that's a synonym for the word offer, to offer or to make available, to proffer. It was written to proffer fellowship, chapter 1, verse 3. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. It was written first to proffer fellowship, to offer fellowship, to make available this fellowship. Secondly, in chapter 1, verse 4, it was written to promote joy. Now from here on out, every text where we have a reason for the writing of this epistle contains in it the word write or the word written. John will say, these things write I unto you, or these things have I written unto you, because, so that every time you come to a reason for the writing of this epistle, you'll find the little word write or the word written. Verse 4, these things write we unto you, that your joy may be full. It was written first to proffer fellowship. Secondly, it was written to promote joy. John said, I'm writing this unto you that your joy may be full. To master this little epistle will increase your joy and my joy. It was written to promote joy. Chapter 2. Now look for the word write or written. My little children, these things write I unto you that ye sin not. It was written thirdly to prevent sin. First, to proffer fellowship, chapter 1, verse 3. Secondly, to promote joy, chapter 1, verse 4. And thirdly, to prevent sin. Now, when he said, these things write I unto you that ye sin not, that's the prohibition of sin. But in the text, you will see the possibility of sin. But he said, if you do, don't do it. But if you do. You see, in that same verse, chapter 2, verse 1, these things write I unto you that you sin not. Don't do it. But if, if any man, if you do. The prohibition is there and the possibility is there also. Don't do it. But you're capable of it. And if you do. So it was written in the next place to prevent sin. Chapter 2 verse 12. It was written to proclaim forgiveness. I write unto you little children because your sins are forgiven you. Past tense. Your sins have been forgiven you. So it was written to proclaim forgiveness. What a doctrine. We'll examine that in our study. Forgiveness. The once for all forgiveness that comes to every born again person. It was written to proffer fellowship, 1-3, to promote joy, 1-4, to prevent sin, 2-1, to proclaim forgiveness, 2-12. Now move over to verse 26. These things have I written unto you concerning them that seduce you. There are deceivers and seducers who would lead the child of God away from the truth. And so John writes to protect the believers, to protect the saints. Thus it was written to proffer fellowship, to promote joy, to prevent sin, to proclaim forgiveness. And there's meat in this little book that will protect you from seducers, from deceivers, from false teachers. Then finally in chapter 5 and verse 13, we have another of the divinely stated reasons for the writing of the epistle. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that you have eternal life. It was written to provide assurance. Do you know that you're saved? It's not enough to be saved. It's important that you have the assurance of your salvation.
So if you master this little epistle of five chapters, all these reasons for its writing, if they become a part of you and me experientially, it will build us up in the family of God. This is a family letter coming from the Father to his dear children, to his born again ones. Now let's look at the first divinely stated reason for the writing of the letter. Here in 1 John chapter 1, we're looking now at verses 1 and 3. Why 1 and 3? Notice verse 2 is in parentheses. Did you notice that? Now, the parenthetical verses in the Bible belong there. The late Dr. Wilbur M. Smith, before his death, was visiting England, and he went to the Westminster Chapel, where the late Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones had preached following the late Dr. G. Camel Morgan. And he always wanted to hear Dr. Lloyd-Jones, great Bible teacher who is now with the Lord. And he got there early and listened to a man teaching a man's Bible class. So he sat in the back, no one knew who he was, didn't know he was the famous Wilbur M. Smith from America, and he heard the teacher of the men's Bible class say this, now whenever you come to a verse in the Bible in parentheses, just discard it. All the parenthetical verses do not belong in the Bible. That isn't true. And Dr. Smith was shocked to hear the teacher of the Bible class. Now, that's true of the italicized words. All of the letters in the slanting type in your Bible, the italicized words, they were inserted by the translators. But the parenthetical verses, those verses in parentheses, belong there. It simply means that the writer injects something before going on with what he started. For example, if you read verse 1 and go immediately into verse 3, it'll make sense. Now, you don't throw verse 2 out of your Bible. Leave it there. But the writer injects a thought, then he goes on with what he began in verse 3. So I'm going to read verse 1 and go right to verse 3. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. See, it makes sense. But you don't throw verse 2 out. The writer comes up with the thought, injects it, and then in verse 3 goes right on with what he started in verse 1. Let's look now at the first reason for the writing of the epistle. It is to proffer fellowship. Now at this point, you will notice the word fellowship appears four times in chapter 1. You see that? You have it in verse 3, mark it there in verse 3, twice. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you that ye also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship, twice in verse 3. You have it once in verse 6, if we say that we have fellowship, and then you have it again in verse 7. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship. Now what does John mean by fellowship here? The word for fellowship is a word, I'm going to give it to you if you're taking notes, it's the Greek word koinonia, K-O-I-N-O-N-I-A, K-O-I, koino, N-O-N-I-A, koinonia. It's translated fellowship. It comes from the Greek word konos, which means common, common. So fellowship, two persons are having fellowship, they have something in common. And so you have the word uh, companion. It has that same Greek root. Or the word communion, fellowship. Common, something in common. This is the idea of the word fellowship. Koinonia, to share in common, to have in common. Sometimes it is translated partaker or partner. To be partners, to be fellows, to be sharers in common. Thus we have the word partnership. A partnership is when two or more persons share something in common, spiritually. Let me show you how it appears in 2 Peter 1.4. 2 Peter is the book immediately preceding 1 John, so you have no problem getting it. 2 Peter 1.4, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these ye might be partakers 
of the divine nature. Now, what is a partaker? A partaker is, becomes a partner. Partaker, partner, fellow, companion, something in common. You're a partaker of the divine nature. So the fellowship begins with a right relationship to God. Notice what John says. Our fellowship is with the Father. When we're born again, a fellowship between God and me has been established. That's called fellowship in the Bible. But you will notice, please, that it includes His Son. Truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. It is impossible, ladies and gentlemen, it is impossible for an individual to be in fellowship with God and reject the Lord Jesus Christ. No way. No way. Doesn't matter what your catechism says, what your preacher or your rabbi or your priest say. What does the Bible say? There is no communion with God. There is no worship of God. There is no fellowship with God apart from the Lord Jesus Christ. Truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. Look at chapter 2 of this first epistle of John, verse 22. Who is a liar? But he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ, he is Antichrist, that denieth the Father and the Son. You can't reject the Son and at the same time not reject the Father. When you reject God's Son, you automatically reject God the Father. Let me read on. Whosoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father. Verse 24. Let that therefore abide in you which ye have heard from the beginning. If that which ye have heard from the beginning shall remain in you, ye also shall continue in the Son and in the Father. Is that clear? This is how the relationship is established. This fellowship. How does it begin? We become a partaker of God's nature. We're now partners with God. But how do we get into that partnership? By accepting both the Father and the Son. Look at chapter 5 of 1 John, please. Note verse 7. There are three that bear record in heaven. The Father, the Word, that's the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. Look at verse 10. He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar because he believeth not the record that God gave of his Son. You deny what the record of God's Word says concerning his Son, you deny God. You reject the Son of God, you reject the Father. Our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. You have it there in verse 10, verse 11, and in verse 20, chapter 5. And we know that the Son of God has come, and hath given us an understanding, that we may know Him that is true. And we are in Him that is true, even in His Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. Do you know the true God? You'll come to know him only as you know the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, John speaks of this clearly in the gospel record in chapter 14. Turn, please, to John chapter 14. The 14th chapter of the gospel according to John, reading from verse 6. In John 14, 6, the Lord said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. You claim God as your Father? The only way you get to the Father is through the Son. If ye had known me, ye should have known my Father also. And from henceforth ye know him, and have seen him. Philip saith unto him, Lord, show us the Father. You talk about God the Father, we've never seen him. We want to see him. Show him. Show him. Seeing is believing. You show us God and we'll believe me. Now, you can't see God. John 4, 24 says God is spirit. God doesn't have a body. God is spirit. And a spirit is not visible to our human eyes. God is spirit. You can't see God. We want to see God. Seeing is believing. Jesus saith unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? 
He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. Hmm. How do you like that? Believest thou not that I am in the Father and the Father in me? You can't be saved and reject the Lord Jesus. When I was a young pastor many years ago in the church where I began my ministry 50 years ago, I preached one Sunday night on John 14, 6. We had a drugstore in our town that was operated by a Roman Catholic man, a fine man, a gentleman, a man who was a real pharmacist. He was, took a personal interest in people's needs, and you could call 3 o'clock in the morning, and in those days they mixed the prescriptions. You didn't get all the pharmaceutical things in capsules or uh, pills or whatever. But he was right there. His wife was not quite so friendly, particularly when a Protestant came in. I came in one Monday morning for a tube of toothpaste, and uh, she hit me right between the eyes. She always called me Reverend with an emphasis on the D. She said, I said, good morning, and she grunted. And uh, she said, Reverend, I hear you were very dogmatic in your sermon last night. Well, I knew she wasn't there because in those days, Roman Catholics and Protestants didn't have the rapport that they have today. Today it's common for a Roman Catholic to go into a Protestant church and vice versa, but not in those days, not 50 years ago. And uh, I said, oh, I, I'm not dogmatic. He said, I heard you were. And I said, what did you hear? He said, I heard that you said there's only one way to heaven. And I said, no, I was preaching from John 14, 6, where Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And as quickly as I got that out of my mouth, she said, that's your interpretation. <laughs> well, I said, I, I have a little time. What's yours? This was her interpretation, her explanation of John 14, 6. She said, now you know there are a lot of different religion." She said, we have the Jehovah's Witnesses. They want to go to Philadelphia. They decide to ride bicycles. She said, we have Christian scientists. They want to go to Philadelphia. They decide to walk. She said, we have Jews. They want to go to Philadelphia. They go by automobile. She said, we have Protestants. They want to go to Philadelphia. They get on the train. And we have Roman Catholics. We want to go to Philadelphia, so we get on a boat and go down the Delaware River. She said, Reverend, can't you see that we all got to Philadelphia? We just went by different ways. I said, that sounds good, but there's something wrong with your explanation. She said, what's that? I said, we're not going to Philadelphia. You see, we're going to heaven or we're going to hell. And we're going by faith in Jesus Christ or we're not going to get there. Is that clear? Our Lord said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Now, in his first epistle, John tells us how this fellowship is established in verse 3. He said, we want you to have fellowship with us, and truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. Now, are you in the fellowship have you had a genuine born-again experience? Is God your heavenly Father through faith in Christ? Are you one of his dear children? If so, then you are in the fellowship. You're in the family. Now this is how the fellowship commences with the new birth. Second Peter 1, 4, again, we become partakers of the divine nature. Now how does this fellowship continue? If you remember Acts chapter 2 and verse 44, on the day of Pentecost, thousands were saved. And in Acts 2.44 it said, And they had all things common. That word common is a part of the word communion, companion. Some of the, from the same Greek word as fellowship, partakers, partners. They had all things in common. Now this word is translated differently in several passages. Same Greek word, different meanings. For example, in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 13, it is translated distribution. Look at that passage for just a moment, and let the Apostle Paul throw a little light on this word koinonia. 2 Corinthians 9 and verse 13. 
Whilst by the experiment of this ministration they glorify God for your professed subjection unto the gospel of Christ and for your liberal distribution. When they generously distributed to others, they were fellowshipping. Fellowshipping. They were having something, sharing something in common with someone who needed what they had. That's called fellowship. Called a distribution in 2 Corinthians 9.13. In Romans chapter 15, it is called a contribution. Turn please to Romans chapter 15. When you found the 15th chapter, please note verse 26. It hath pleased them of Macedonia and Achaia to make a certain contribution for the poor saints which are at Jerusalem. When we make a contribution to someone in need, we are fellowshipping. We are sharing with them something we have, sharing it in common. They become a partaker of what we have. Thus we are fellowshipping. Same word. Translated distribution, translated contribution. It's a great family when we have a common Father, a common Savior and Lord, and we're all brothers and sisters in Christ, and we share with one another. Sitting at the breakfast table, a lady said, Ever since your wife's stroke, I have prayed for you and Elsie every day. That's fellowship. She's been fellowshipping in the gospel, sharing, fellowshipping, great family, fellowship with one another. Now, I want to look at verse 6 of 1 John 1, and we're going to see the phonies, the pretenders, the fakers, the professors. Now, before I direct your attention to verse 6, let me make it clear that calling oneself a Christian does not make one a Christian. I can say I'm in fellowship with God. That doesn't mean I am. Saying so doesn't make it so. Calling yourself a Christian doesn't make you a Christian. Telling me that you believe in God as your father doesn't mean that you have been born into his family. Saying so does not make it so. Now there are three verses in 1 John all beginning with the same three words. You can count by twos. You'll never forget these three verses. They're 6, 8, and 10. Look at those verses. All three verses begin with the same three words. What are they? If we say. Now, if we say something that is not true, then we are liars. We're not telling the truth. Now, let's look at the sixth verse for a moment. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. Now, we have to get to understand that word darkness in the context. It could mean physical darkness. Then the Bible speaks of intellectual darkness. In 2 Corinthians, Paul tells us how the devil blinds the minds of people. They become darkened intellectually. That's not the meaning here. The darkness here is moral and spiritual darkness. It's not physical. It's not intellectual. It's moral and spiritual. Now, if we say that we're in this family, we have fellowship with God, and we walk in darkness. Now, that word walk is a very interesting word because you must understand how it's used. It is not used physically. Uh, how did I get to this platform? Well, it's very simple how I got to this platform. I came through a door back yonder, and uh, I placed one foot in front of the other. That's called walking. Tremendous deduction. I know you didn't know that, but that's called walking. That's physical walking. Now, suppose coming down the aisle, I would have taken three steps and uh, stopped. I never would have gotten to the platform. Now, walking is for the purpose of arriving at a destination. I wanted to get to this platform. So I took a reiterated first step. A reiterated first step. A repeated. I took the first step and took the second and the third and I just kept one after the other until I got to the platform. A reiterated first step. Now, there are some people who profess to be in the family but they've never taken the first step. They're walking 
but they're walking in moral and spiritual darkness. Whenever Paul used the word walk, he never used it of a physical walk. He always used it of behavior, deportment, manner of living, the way I carry myself, not physically from one geographical location to another, but the way I carry myself morally, spiritually, my behavior, my deportment, the way I carry myself as a husband or wife, a mother or father, son or daughter, employer, employee, as a neighbor, as the citizen of a city, the state, or the country, my behavior, my manner of living, the way I carry myself, not physically, not the way I walk, placing one foot in front of that, but the way I behave myself. That's the meaning of the word walk. For example, in Ephesians chapter 5, you, Paul uses it in a way similar to the way John uses it. Turn to Ephesians 5 for just a moment. And in verse 8, Paul said, For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. He's talking about moral and spiritual darkness. Once you were unsaved, walk as children of light. You once were in the dark. You've been translated out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of God's family. God is light. And in him is no darkness at all. So John says in his first epistle here, Jesus said in John 8, 12, I am the light of the world. He said to his disciples in Matthew chapter 5, verse 14, You are now the light of the world. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. You see, beloved, we've been brought out of darkness into light when we're born again. And one of the evidences, one of the earmarks that we are in the fellowship is that we walk as children of light. Now there are pretenders, there are phonies, they're in every church. Please don't look for a perfect church. Some people become so critical. They say, well, I'd go to your church, but they're hypocrites there. Certainly they're hypocrites in every church. We got room for one more. Come in. No perfect church. There are pretenders, of course. People go through the motions. They have intellectual, academic faith, but they've never had a salvation experience. He's dealing with the phony here. With the pretense. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. Now in chapter 1 you have three if we says. You see them? 6, 8, and 10. Now move over quickly to chapter 2 and you have three verses beginning with the phrase, He that saith. He that saith. Verse 4, verse 6, and verse 9. He that saith. Now look at chapter 2, verse 4. He that saith, I know him... Oh, I know God, but keepeth not his commandments is a what? Liar. That's strong language. Now, in chapter 1, he said, if we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie. That's a little milder. But in chapter 2, he says, you're a liar. When we say something that is not true. Now, my father was not a Christian. He was a Jewish immigrant from Germany. He had some excellent background in what a family ought to be like. I'm not saying that he practiced it wholly, but he certainly taught a lot of it to us. And I thank God for many lessons I learned from my unsafe father. Good principles. And uh, one of them was we were never allowed to use any kind of language that was strong or even suggestive. Now God says if we're pretending, we're liars. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. Do you notice in the creation story in Genesis chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, God divided the light from the darkness? Light and darkness cannot exist in the same place. They are mutually exclusive. You go into a dark room, push the button, what happens? The light comes on, but the darkness disappears. Push it again, what happens? The light disappears and the darkness appears. They are mutually exclusive. You can't have both. You can't have light and darkness. When Paul wrote his second epistle to the Corinthians in chapter 6, verse 14, he said, Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellow 
relationship hath light with darkness? Answer, none. Fellowship and darkness have nothing in common. Are you in the family or are you a pretender? A mere professor. What is the earmark, the evidence that I'm born again? You find that in 1 John chapter 1, verse 7, the practice of fellowship, and with this I close. If we walk in the light, that's a spiritual light now, the entrance of God's word giveth light. God is light. Christ said, I am the light of the world. The Bible is the book of light. The entrance of God's word giveth light. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, then we, he and I, have fellowship one with another. How do I know I'm in the family? I just keep walking in the light. I take the first step as a young Christian, and then I take that reiterated or repeated step, and I just keep on walking in the light. Read my Bible daily, obey my Bible as I read it, respond to the truth of God's Word, I put it into practice, I'm walking in the light, and the fellowship is wonderful. God and I have fellowship, and my wife and I have fellowship, and my children and I have fellowship, and it just keeps going on. Wonderful fellowship. I hope you're in it today. If you are, let's start walking in it. Don't take just the first step, then stop. Mm-mm. Take that reiterated, repeated step and just keep on walking in the light. How do I walk in the light? Just in the light of the Word. Have my Bible reading each day. Obey the Lord. Obey the light. And God and I have fellowship. And my fellowship with others increases.